Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. I am, I'm always excited. This is the line I always run. But today I've got someone incredibly awesome with us. Uh, it's Guy Walters, everyone. Yay! Um, he's a historian, just in case you don't know who Guy Walters is. Just in case. Uh, he's a historian, journalist, and broadcaster. You've most likely seen him all over the TV. He's always on the TV. Uh, and most of the newspapers you've read, um, he's written some amazing books like Hunting Evil, Berlin Games, and The Real Great Escape. And I'm going to introduce him as... Animal Annabelle Venning's husband. Welcome, Guy. Oh, thank you. And I am proud to be Annabelle Venning's husband. In fact, we've been married for 20 years come May. So there we go. It's oh, our whatever it is. China anniversary or porcelain or something like that. I can't remember. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So so um you've had Annabelle on, on this and, and I've been on here. I think I was almost like your first or second first guest on the and how many episodes have there been since well funnily enough you are going out on the anniversary uh, or round about the anniversary of the great escape which is what we're going to be talking about today but i think if i'm not mistaken alex and i spoke you're actually going to go out I, I, if i'm not mistaken on the same day that you went out as our first podcast all right. Okay. That's really creepy and very, very strange indeed. So obviously I'm just going to have to keep, you know, reappearing on that anniversary every time. Every, <laughs> anyway, every year, it it's lovely be... to be on. It looks like you've had, you've done hundreds of podcasts now. We have. Do you know what? If you have your book completed by this time next year, the new book, then we can, we probably could be able to pull that off, you know? Yay. We definitely could. We have something to aim for. Definitely. Let's do that. Right. But, um, We're here to talk about The Great Escape, uh, The Real Great Escape, because you wrote a book about it, haven't you? I have. I wrote a book called The Real Great Escape, and it was looking at the true story behind the movie that a lot of people know and love. And just in case anybody hasn't watched the movie, Alina, have you watched the movie? Oh, of course I've watched the movie. What Fine. The-, <laughs> the Great Escape is a story of uh, 76 Allied prisoners of war, or 80 if I'm going to be really exact, 80 Allied prisoners of war escaping from Stalag Luft III, a high security prisoner of war camp in Silesia um, near a town called Zagan, or how do I say it? Zagan. And, uh, and, and they escape in March 1944. And it's this mass breakout of Allied prisoners through a tunnel um, and they all run off into the forest and towards a train station and run all over the, you know, the Silesian landscape. And they are tracked down by the Germans and lots of them are recaptured. And the reason why we know all about this escape and not other mass escapes, because there were other great escapes or other mass breakouts during the Second World War, is that the tragic ending to this story, if you like, is that on Hitler's direct order, 50 of the recaptured POWs are executed. They're shot. They are shot in the back of their head individually or in pairs um, as they are urinating on the side of the road by Gestapo officers. Um, it's a murder story as well as a story about, you know, ingenuity and bravery. And it's it's a story that's kind of gone into sort of World War II legend or myth, if you like, as something that's opening a third front with inside Germany. It, it's it's a thing all about, you know, the great duty to escape. It, it's, it's, there's so many levels to this story. And when I looked at it, I thought, hang on a minute, you know, how much of the film, how much of the previous history, you know, is true? And I really wanted, you know, in the book to lift up the rug and like all good historians to work out, you know, what was really going on. So that's basically where I'm coming from. I mean, you did some really great talks about this. I mean, I'm hoping somebody who's listened to the podcast was there. Was it May, March, March two years ago? Yeah, I, 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 I've, I've spoken about the um, the Great Escape at the RAF Club. To a lot of the escapers were members of the Royal Air Force. I've also done a series of uh, of crowdcasts, of video uh, um, lectures or series about about the Great Escape, um, which uh, people can go, if they go to my crowdcast page. Just type in Guy Walters and Crowdcast and up it'll come and you can actually buy all five hours of that for the bargain price of 15 quid. <laughs> and uh, that comes with maps and Google Earth and shows the routes that all the prisoners took. So, yeah, I've, I've spoken about it a lot, but I think it's it's one of those stories. And we are now on the 24th, 25th of March as that approaches. Um, that is the 77th anniversary of The Great Escape. 
Um, and it, it is it is a story that always, I think, needs to be unpicked and examined. I mean, we've filled, I mean, there's so many of these World War II myths. I mean, me alone on my own, I've been unpicking these horrible things that have actually, they've become true and fact. And people believe that they're fact. And they're actually writing about them in the books as if they're fact, these myths. It's, it's just mind blowing. Yeah, it's one of those things that you, you know, and, I, and, and you know, any decent historian will know is, you know, you, you first of all, you start researching a project, you, you read what other people have written. And if they've written a proper book, it'll have end notes or footnotes. And and you go back to the, the end note or the footnote and you'll then see that the source is another book. So then you go to that book and then you look at the page and <laughs> you find the source of that. It's another book. So you then go to that book and then you find in that, say, that third book down the line that that's the only source for a particular fact. And you go, well, hang on a minute, where is that data from? You know, you've got to be very scientific about it. And then you realise, well, if the only, if the start point of that piece of data is simply a book, that can be complete rubbish. And, And of course, facts or, you know, junk facts or junk history or fake news, whatever you want to call it, builds upon itself. And, you know, that's what I found when I was you know, writing about Simon Wiesenthal, the, the Nazi hunter for my book, Hunting Evil. I, I would, you know, look at these claims that he had you know, tracked down a thousand Nazis. And, and, and you realize that it's just complete rubbish. He never had, you know, because these are simply journalists and, 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 and junk historians were just building on top of other people's junk facts. And actually, that's why it's really important. You've got to go right back to the beginning. And that's what I did with this project. I looked at the original, you know, debriefs of the POWs. I looked at interviews they gave very shortly after the war. I I looked at testimony they'd given to the RAF Special Investigation Branch. And and you've got to look at the, the, the scraps of evidence you can gather as near to the event as possible. Because believe you me, if you are talking to a 95 year old veteran of the Great Escape, you know, he, bless him, isn't going to give you as reliable an account of what took place as uh, some, you know, as he would have done in 1945. I mean, that's just obvious because we all know our memory, you know, even even yeah. at our grand old age gets shot to pieces. So it, there's no doubt that you've got to go back to the original material. And ultimately, you've got to try and avoid other people's books because they can be complete bullshit. Right. So let's debunk some of these myths. I think yeah. I think we should do a bit of debunking. So I'm going to hit you with the first one, which is uh, apparently the Allied airmen had a duty to escape from prisoner of war camps. Is this true? Yeah. Now, this is you know one of the enduring myths about the Great Escape. Is, and, it, and I think it's very much projected in the movie. Uh, is that the idea that you've got this sort of body of, of downed prison, downed airmen, all of whom are POWs, who all have a duty to escape and indeed are all very hungry and keen to escape. Now, there are two elements to this. First, was there a duty to escape? No, there was not. That is a myth. There was a duty, and this was written down um, and given to air crew, there was a duty to evade capture. So by that, I mean that if you were shot down and, and you had survived an air crash, let's not forget that everybody in that camp had been in an air crash, and not many listeners today to this will have been in air crashes. And if you had been in an air crash and say you, you know, parachuted to the ground or you successfully crash landed and survived, it was your duty to evade capture and make your way back to enemy line, uh, your own lines. Now, if you were captured and then held as a prisoner of war, you were protected, hopefully under certain protocols in the Geneva Convention. But you did not have a duty to escape. And just as you didn't have a duty to escape, the people holding you, um, however, did have a legal uh, 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 permission to shoot you if you did try to escape. So, you know, the idea of escaping is, it, is a dangerous business because you can be shot doing it quite legally. Um, and so this is why, you know, the Germans, when they do execute the POWs, um, uh, the Great Escape POWs in, in sort of March onwards, 1944, they say they were shot you know, in inverted commas, while trying to escape, because that was their kind of let out. So I think I think it's really important to get to this idea there's a duty. And the second part to this is this whole idea that the majority of the POWs in a camp like Stalag Luftwaffe actually wanted to escape. I'm afraid it's just not true. 
you know, we look at the movie and they're all very gung ho young chaps and Americans and Brits and you name it. And they're all very keen to escape and forge passes and, you know, make false costumes and do this and that. In fact, only a third of POWs really had any interest in escape activities at all. Now, this sounds as though I'm giving a sort of terribly sort of um, bullshit, lefty, pinko kind of analysis <laughs> and doing down the POWs as if I sort of hate them. I don't. Honestly, don't take my word for it. Take the words of Jimmy James. Jimmy James, one of the most celebrated escapers of the Second World War. And it's in his memoirs and indeed in his interview he gave um, that's contained in the Imperial War Museum in which he says only about a third of prisoners wanted to escape. Two thirds had really no wish to do so. Because that barbed wire, Alina, in the, in, the, in the middle of that forest in Silesia, that may have represented your captivity, but mm. it also represented security. It meant you weren't have to get you weren't have to going to get into a plane again. Uh, you could stay safely on the ground, um, you know, in this camp and sit out the war. You could study for accountancy exams. You could study, uh, you know, le le your legal qualifications. You name it, you could get on. And, and plot your post-war life sitting in that camp. So really, it's not me, you know, being sort of uh, horrible about these guys. No, really, but there was no duty to escape, and the majority of prisoners have no desire to escape at all. I find it really interesting because I was, cause I was actually at your talk in, in March two years ago, and I sat there and through the whole time I was thinking, oh, my God, it escapes from concentration camps. I mean, there's very similar. I mean, it's quite similar, but also some really incredibly different points that happen at this time. So, for example, when um, prisoners escape from Auschwitz, for example, they are going to they're going to get ended. Doesn't matter. Left, right or centre. They will get shot. There is no yes. discussion about that. Um, and, for example, they had better help on the outside. So the partisans in Poland, especially because they were in Poland, they had help from uh, the local AK resistance and they could provide them with clothing and passes. And this, they had a better chance of survival. These guys are going out in the middle of Germany, theoretically, um, yes. because now it's now it's Poland. Well, it was Germany before the war, this bit. So it's yeah, sort of... Uh, exactly. yeah. Now, 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 Poland. Let's let's because yes, someone, now the greatest country in Europe. Yeah, <laughs> someone is so going to get me for this for saying, well, you know. Anyway, um, and they have to escape into German-speaking people. Okay, and if, how many? The question, next question is, how many of them actually spoke German and fluently to the point that they could pass off as Germans? I mean, it's. It's mind blowing well, to how they were. You're absolutely right, and th this is one of the, one of the reasons why the Great Escape was kind of doomed to failure. Um, and and it, it, the link, the language thing is really important. You're absolutely right. Now, the first thing you got to remember: of, of the 80 men who get out that tunnel, four are immediately recaptured. So you've got 76 guys on the loose. How many of them speak German? Ooh, I mean, I've never formally counted it. I could go through my list in the appendix of my book, um, but I'm guessing no more than about. <laughs> wow. about that so first of all that's a problem now that's not a problem if you are say uh, one of the Norwegian airmen who is escaping so you've got some Norwegian airmen who are escaping yeah, uh, Per Bergsland and Jens Müller because Norway is an occupied country you had young Norwegian men walking around the Third Reich as forced laborers or, or even as you know paid laborers so they didn't necessarily have to speak German. And if you were a Norwegian speaker or you were Bulgarian or, or whatever it was, if you, if you were of a nationality that was part of the Third Reich and had been sort of, you know, was under Hitler's jackboot, you didn't necessarily have to speak German. So you were all right. But if your only language was English, you had a real problem because, you know, there was no reason for people, you know, for Anglophone people to be in the Third Reich because the Third Reich did not encompass an Anglophone territory apart from the Channel Islands. So you, know, you you really had a problem. So therefore, you then have to pose as another nationality. And that, of course, is tricky. So you've got a man like Desmond Plunkett, who is a British POW who escapes on the Great Escape. And he's got a very British name. It's so British, isn't it? Desmond Plunkett. Exactly. He looked very British as well. I mean, a great big sort of, you know, he just looked like a total Brit with a great big moustache. And, 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 and he was posing as a Bulgarian called Sergei Bolanov, hoping that whoever stopped him would be unlikely to speak Bulgarian. 
but you know it's you know he would accidentally speak in british you know he he once sort of went to the loo when he was on the escape at the gents you know at the urinal and he was a bit desperate for a pee and when he finished he went oh that's better in english and there's this german bloke standing next to him who sort of thought my god who's this mad bloke so you know it, it was very easy of course if you're tired stressed and on the run you know even if you're posing as a non-brit to fall back into speaking english so, yeah, I, I think the linguistic thing is a real problem, but you've got so many other problems. I mean, you've just got the weather. Um, you know, at the moment, and I'm speaking from the UK in mid-March, you know, the weather is, it's it's spring-like. It's it's about 10 degrees Celsius outside. It's not bad. Uh, you know, March 44, Silesia, I've got the old um, weather charts. It's cold. It's naught, minus two yeah. Um, you know, and you've got prisoners in very basic, you know, escape outfits, you know, some of them wearing equivalent to kind of chinos. They are very, very badly prepared for the weather. There ain't no Gore-Tex in 44. <laughs> you know, there aren't proper big thermal boots. You know, I, they, they, they are wearing flimsy clothes and it is bloody cold. I can vouch for the weather because next week in Poland and I, I'm, I am in Silesia, but I'm on the wrong side of Silesia right now. Um, right. So I'm further in the south, but I can vouch right now that next week, which is when it's supposed to be the anniversary, it is going to be at least minus three. Really? So 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 your conditions in late March, more or less the same part of the world, are pretty much identical what it would have been like to the Great Escape. Yeah. Is, there, is there any snow on the ground with you or do you think it might snow? Uh, apparently it's going to snow, uh, which is why all the motorcyclists are out right now having fun before uh, the snow hits. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you know more about motorcycling than I do, but I, I you know, if, if it snows and then it kind of melts a bit and then it freezes again and you've got a sort of horrible... Oh, God, muddy, yeah. frozen, brown, grey, snowy, slush, slush <laughs> nastiness. That's what you've got to escape in, wearing yeah. just a pair of normal 1944 boots, maybe a pair of lightweight trousers, a kind of modified RAF tunic to look like a kind of worker's jacket. You know, you may have a great coat if you're lucky. You you won't have a hat because it's really hard for the POWs to sort of make hats. Um, and... You know, it's it's you, there, a lot of them were just woefully ill prepared because you asked me about language and, and, and those who did speak a foreign language were put near the top of the escaping tree, if you like. They were the first to get out and they are the ones given the better passes. They were given you know money to buy train tickets and they're the ones who are going to travel by train across the Third Reich to try and make it to safety you know, i.e. Switzerland, Sweden, or eventually to Spain, you know, to the neutral countries. That was the idea. And, you know, if, if you if you were at the top of the tree, you would have all the best kit. But there were only about 20 of the great escapers had the good kit. The rest were basically what was called hard asses, which meant they just had to kind of hard ass their way across the Silesian frozen slushy countryside um, on very, very basic rations with very little money, very amateur passes. You know, you are talking as the crow flies 660 miles from Biggin Hill, where some of them would have taken off from, you know, in, in, in Kent in southeastern England. So you, you, you've got a long way to go just as the crow flies. Um, and and you, there's just no chance you're going to make it back to Britain. Absolutely none. So this whole idea of Steve McQueen and the beautiful sunshine jumping on his motorcycle through the countryside um, is totally false. It's total nonsense. And I, I'll come on to the motorbike in a bit because I, I know you're a, you're, you're, you're a, you're a biker. But it, it's this idea that you're opening a third front inside Germany. That's another one of the sort of kind of myths of The Great Escape. And it comes across in the film. And it's this idea that was meant to have had been had by Roger Bushell, who was the uh, RAF officer, who was the architect of The Great Escape, who I argue in the book was you know, almost cast himself as a somewhat messianic figure. But the idea that you're going to open up a third front in Germany, you know, with, with, with 80 men or 200 men, as he wanted to get out on night one, it is a joke. You know, the Germans are not using, you know, frontline troops. They're not bringing people off the Russian front you know, to, to, to come and hunt for great escapers. What they do is that they use any man, you know, available, policeman, forestry worker, Hitler youth, home guard. If they're not doing anything else, then they'll just say, right, um, you've got to um, 
you know, you've just got to man a checkpoint. You've got to guard that bridge. We know there are all these escapers on the loose. Be extra vigilant for them. What the Germans do is that they, the, the security police, they, they, they announce what's called a Großfandung, a big alarm. And during this big alarm, they enhance security all over the Third Reich. OK, it doesn't affect the war effort at all. It doesn't affect the war effort. And there was another mass breakout of Allied POWs in 1943 in the year before the Great Escape we're talking about. And in that mass breakout, under the Gross Van Dung, the enhanced alarm, something like eight to nine thousand escaping prisoners and laborers and slaves and you name it, who were also on the run uh, at the, around the Third Reich, were also rounded up thanks to the enhanced security situation. So what you do if you have a mass breakout and the Germans press the big button saying big alarm is that you screw it up for everybody else who's on the run. So the great escapers were told this by some of the sympathetic German officers who were guarding them. They said, look, we know something's going on. Don't do a big thing because you're going to make it much harder for yourself. If you're going to escape, escape in twos and threes, because then you won't have this gross alarm, this big alarm. So, you know, Elena, it's just classic blowback. Um, you know, if, if you if you do the big gesture and, you know, lots of people get out, the Germans are going to punch back hard. If you just have two or three guys getting out, they're not exactly going to mobilize, you know, as many people as, as they would do if 80 get out. So it's it's a it's a kind of a big gesture, a great escape, a mass breakout. But it doesn't really achieve anything because actually it just makes it harder for other people escaping. And it also makes it harder for yourselves to escape. So it. For me, the blowback thing is a total makes the whole thing a total farce in many respects. And the next question, of course, is did Roger Bush or did his fellow officers who organised it know about this blowback? Yes, they did. They they were specifically warned that it was going to make life harder for themselves. So in, in many ways, they still went ahead, despite knowing the fact that ultimately there was very little chance of, of it being a success. And a, a B, it wasn't really going to waste the Germans time at all and see, you know, you, you were risking young lives. So in many ways, you know, if you want to be really negative about The Great Escape, it's possible to be so. I kind of unsheath the knife and I, I, I sort of draw a bit of blood, but I don't, I, don't, I don't totally destroy it because I think that, you know, ultimately what, what else are you going to do if you're in a POW camp if you don't want to study for your accountancy exams? Maybe escaping might be a bit more fun, frankly. I mean, you've had a bit of uh, negative reviews about this just because you were kind of you, you, you had a balanced idea about what it was. I mean, it, nothing is ever, ever so idyllic and perfect as we want to believe. I totally agree. And, I, and there are people for whom things like The Great Escape are a kind of, you know, holy grail story. They're a kind of, you know, it, it's one of those things you can't really, you know, besmirch the memory of. And, you know, as I say, and as you, you know me, Alina, you, you know that I, I don't come with a kind of political agenda, you know, and I, and I found this when researching, I mentioned him earlier, but Simon Wiesenthal, you know, I, I, I very much bought into the idea that Wiesenthal was this kind of, you know, almost saintly figure. And I, you know, I found out that actually he was very duplicitous and, and very fraudulent about his achievements. And, and you've just got to kind of say it, even though it may, you know, cast you in an unflattering light. And I was very worried. And I said to my famous historian wife Annabelle Venning by her books that you know I was very worried when I was doing the Simon Wiesenthal thing that people were going to accuse me of being an anti-Semite and you know and I was very happy when Danny Finkelstein now Lord Finkelstein you know defended me in the Jewish Chronicle saying you know you you've just got to say these things no matter how unpalatable they are you know he's a great Jewish hero Simon Wiesenthal but if he was a bit of a bullshitter well it's got to be said and it's the same with the great escape yeah we do think of it as kind of you know, very sort of British success story in many ways, even though only 50% of the great escapers were British. That's another thing, just in parentheses. But you, you've, you've, got to, you've got to sort of look at these things in the cold light of day and go, well, how great was it? Well, you know, I don't think it was that great. It, it was, it, the ingenuity, building tunnels, building air pumps, hacking things out is, is immense. But actually the whole reason for doing it, I'm not so sure. You know, I want to come back to the escape because you mentioned there was another escape in March 1943. Basically, what you're saying to us is that the Great Escape was not unique. No, it wasn't unique. Unique. You're absolutely right. I mean, there was one. I think you're right. March 43. That was in a place called Zubin. I seem to recall. I think that you you, you have other mass breakouts, and I, I can't list them all from lots of camps. And I think actually it's the French who have the record for the largest mass escape uh, during the war. 
I, I, forgive me, I can't remember the numbers, but I think it's well into three figures. So, you know, the idea that the Great Escape is, is unique is, 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 is total nonsense. It is a Great Escape. It is not the Great Escape. And the reason why it becomes famous is, is, is because of the murders and also because the, the, the escape was written about very successfully by, uh, uh, um, by, by Brickhill, who wrote the book. And he was on, he was, uh, uh, he was at Stalagla 3. Um, he wrote the book, The Great Escape. And, and that book was, it was a huge, you know, big seller. He was an Australian journalist and wrote this very good commercial book. And it had a lot of validity because, of course, he was there. He wasn't an escaper himself. And and so, you know, that that became a big hit and then that got turned into the film. And so, you know, that's why we have this kind of false sense that The Great Escape was unique. It, it just really wasn't. Um, I think we should talk about the motorcycle only because... Oh, I knew! I knew that pause meant you, you were revving up. <laughs> oh, that's... A, oh, it just took me a second to get that. <laughs> hey, yeah, you see. Oh, I'm sharp, I'm sharp. Well, sharp this morning. Yes. So, anyway, the motorcycle. Yes, it is. It is just not true. And and, and there's even a scene in the film in which, um, you know, I think his character came by, played by James Coburn escapes on a bicycle. And that's not true either. If, if the POWs knew that if they stole so much as a bicycle, that was a potential, you know, that was a hanging offence potentially you know stealing third right property you know really problematic so yes stealing motorbikes was you know it, 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 it's it's a seductive and charming story and i actually helped make a documentary with guy martin the uh, uh famous uh I'm biker so and stunt man and all around i'm so uh, jealous uh, good of guy, that guy <laughs> good guy nutcase and uh, so yeah it was the two guys in silesia <laughs> and we, we had a great weekend together and um but he he recreated the jump for Channel Four about two. I think it was screened about two Christmases ago, wasn't it? So I think it was late 2019 that came out, and um, that was that was a great doc documentary to work on. And, and and of course the the escape on on the motorbike, you know, with McQueen is great fun. And you know the the serious point is motorbikes aside, and I'm sure people will say, oh, it was the wrong bike anyway. It's a BMW rather than a Triumph or a Triumph rather than a I can never, I know nothing about bikes. That's your department, Alina. <laughs> people always say, ah, oh, but the other thing is there weren't any Americans on The Great Escape. Well, technically they're right. There weren't any Americans on The Great Escape itself, but Americans were involved in the camp and they were involved in some of the preparations of The Great Escape because you've got to imagine that that, that for obvious reasons, these POW camps grow and grow throughout the war as more and more people are captured. And the Americans were lumped in with a load of Brits in the North Compound. And, and during the preparations, when during the preparations, Great Escape, when numerous tunnels are being built, it was some American officers, a man called Clark, was actually responsible for the security of these tunnels and, and, and making sure that the diggers didn't get rumbled and spying on the German spies who came in members of the German military uh, uh, intelligence unit, the Abwehr. And uh, so, so you do have Americans involved on, you know, preparations for the escape. So yeah, you, you could say that Americans were involved in the Great Escape. There's no doubt about it. I've got a question from Zach, who was supposed to join us, but he didn't make it. Um, he's interested. Is the blind guy, was he real as well? Ah, now that's the Donald Pleasance figure um, in which you have a forger who goes basically blind by, by forging so many documents and working so hard. Yeah, it's, it's not a true figure. There's, there's no account of... I mean, listen, you don't go blind through eye strain. I mean, that's just nonsense. You, you just need to rest your eyes. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm probably completely wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. And <laughs> your, 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 um, the forgeries is a really interesting thing anyway. And I'm glad Zach's brought this up because it's really hard to forge a typewritten document by hand. You cannot write a typewritten document. You, you could just about do so, but you can't do it hundreds of times. And what they would do is they would make kind of amateur printing presses out of bits of gelatine that they would sort of melted down out of their Red Cross rations. But actually, a lot of the passes were typed out by the wife of one of the German guards who um, the German guard had been bribed and blackmailed and coerced into getting his wife to do it when he was next away on leave. So 
actually, there, there are a lot of elements of, of the Great Escape that couldn't have taken place without German assistance because the guards were so old and lame and rackety and useless that they were desperate for cigarettes and extra food from the prisoners. You know, the, the Germans are getting less food than the POWs at times because of the Red Cross parcels coming in. So they were eminently bribable. And, and the RAF officers and the other allied um, airmen would, would, would bribe the guards to get what they wanted, such as, you know, negative for cameras and so on and so forth. So, in fact, the, you know, I described the, the Great Escape, I describe the Great Escape as, as, as almost the most successful Anglo-German cooperation since the marriage of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Because, you know, and you, you don't have to take my word for it, the RAF's official report into the Great Escape uh, written just after or just just towards the end of the war says the escape would, could not have happened without the assistance of the germans and when the escape is rumbled and when it is discovered you know that weekend in march 44 77 years ago um and when the german security police turn up um at the camp it's not the prisoners they are interrogating it's their fellow germans it's the german guards it's the, it's the commandant it's his officers you know they're the ones in trouble not the prisoners so I think that gives you an example that, you know, things like the forgery and all these sort of things, you know, it can't really have taken place unless there have been bribery and corruption on a grand scale. I find that so it's so interesting because on the flip side, obviously, I'm going to bring up concentration camps because I always do. Yeah. The guards are just a complete mirror image. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, well, I mean, your 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 guards in 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 a, a, a part in your concentration camp, Selena, and I say your concentration camp, I, but forgive me for sounding flippant, but you know <laughs> what I mean. Um, I mean, they're part of the Tottenkopf Band, right? I mean, they're they're they're, they're the SS Death's Head unit, which yeah. you know they they aren't very pleasant men and women. Um, generally, the the guards of POW camps in the third reich were the same sort of guards as say the brits or the canadians would have had in pow camps in britain and canada they they would they were typically you know older men you're not going to use a 24 year old fit young soldier to guard people in a pow camp you're going to use old men my age um uh, uh, uh and i'm in my I, i'm very old i'm 49 50 in august and i and I, so you're not going to use so you're going to use older men or some of these guys may have been wounded. Um, you know, the RAF special report is very withering about the German guards and says they're a kind of bit of a useless rabble. Um, and, and it's pretty rude about them and says they're kind of really desperate for cigarettes and chocolate and stuff like this. You know, and indeed they might have been, you know, because they didn't have a lot of food and they were fed up with five years of war like everyone else. And they probably felt cold, bored, hungry and tired. And, you know, your average German guard had about two cigarettes a day. Your average POW in Stalagla 3 had 10, right? Cigarettes oh, wow. are the big currency. So if your prisoners are kind of five times richer than your guards, I would say that, you know, it's almost inevitable you're going to get corruption. Of course it is. Um, you know, if you're guarding people five times richer than you, <laughs> you might be tempted to take some cash off them in return for some special privileges. We've already spoken, well, we've touched on this, actually, um, but I want to know more. I want you to go a little bit more depth in this. So in your opinion, was this a mistake and how big of a mistake was it? I think, first of all, we must be very tempted not to not to fall into the old historian's trap of of, of, of Captain Hindsight being your guide. You know, we cannot let Hindsight be your guide. Did Roger Bushell and his fellow organising officers know that the Germans were going to murder so many of his fellow great escapers? Did he know that? No, he didn't. Um, what he did know and what he was warned about by the Germans was that actually there had been a change of policy in Germany and escaped POWs weren't necessarily going to be the responsibility of the camps or the service that was running the camp. So in the case of Stalag Luft III, it was run by the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. And if you're an escape POW, you are still the responsibility of the Luftwaffe. Luftwaffe. Now, new policy had taken place in which escape POWs could end up in the hands of the SS and the Gestapo. That clearly changed the landscape in terms of what might happen to you, because I don't need to tell you, Alina, what would happen if you fell into the hands of the SS or the Gestapo. So yeah. the prisoners were very much aware of the fact that, you know, as, as, as the Germans said, you know, 
escaping has ceased to be a sport. You know, it, it's not a kind of, you know, field sport. You know, it, it is now something that, that could end up very likely in your death. Also, um, clearly it was not going to open some sort of front inside Germany. Clearly you weren't going to get 80 men back home. So, you know, really what was it for? I do regard it as a failure in essence of, of it was a needless risk. It was a needless risk. And although I appreciate just because the Germans tell you to do something, you're not necessarily going to obey your enemy during the war and say, oh, I'm just going to do as you tell me. But I think the relationship between the officers who ran the camp and their captives was much more nuanced than a straight enemy and captive relationship. It was very much a relationship, I would argue, between university tutor and professor and student or say master at a boys school and pupil it was yeah they, they, they were they were wanting the best for you and by and large the relationship between the germans and uh the the the, the pow's was, was very good and 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 was trust you know there was mutual trust and the testimony of that is the fact that they would meet up with each other after the war so, you know, that that is not something that you would imagine going on at an Auschwitz reunion, yeah. right? So it, that shows you there was a very different relationship going on between, say, like a man like Hermann Glemnitz on, on the German camp staff and and a man called Rod, uh, Wings Day, who, who met up after the war on quite frequent occasions. So clearly there was a relationship there which wasn't straightforward. It wasn't straight goody and baddy relationship. So I think that the Germans should have been listened to more by Bushel. And I think that he did risk young men's lives for what I think is kind of a bit of an act of folly, really. Um, now, I know it's an unpalatable thing to say, but I, that's kind of what I feel. I think I've been very resentful if my son had died. It is not Roger Bushel's fault that these men were executed. Roger Bushel is not complicit in these men's death. Now, I've got to be really clear about that. That is the responsibility of Adolf Hitler and those who obeyed him. But it is important to know that it was acknowledged to be a very dangerous thing. There sometimes is no point in carrying out a dangerous mission if there is nothing to be gained by doing it. And that is what I feel. Sorry. No, that's great. I mean, did you say that most of them didn't want to escape? It was only a specific proportion. So did about any, a third, yeah. Yeah, so about a third of them. So did they have any doubts about escaping? You, have you spoken to any of the survivors that have said, look, well, we were kind of doubtful that we should escape, we shouldn't escape? So, I mean, survivors of the Great Escape were not available to me, uh, you know, and obviously for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, and um, I and, and some of the guys who had survived when I wrote the book, you know, weren't in the position to talk to me. Um, not not because they didn't like me or anything. It's just that, you know, for, for again for other sort of reasons. And I, I think that the, the, the guys on the a lot the guys on the escape. So, you know, going back to the original idea, you want to look at documents and interviews from near the time and some of the earlier interviews of the great escapers. They express some of them very clearly that they knew there was no hope that this was going to this was going to work. You know, there was no hope. But actually, one of the escapers, a man called uh, Sidney Dowes, said, you know, I knew I wasn't going to get back home. And I'm paraphrasing here, Alina. I knew I wasn't going to get back home. But I just thought I'd rather see a little bit more of Germany before the war was over. You know, and, and, and it was kind of escaping as, you know, an activity, something to keep a young mind, active mind busy, something, to, you know, you know some, some, something for idle hands to do. And, and basically, if you wanted to see a little bit more of the Third Reich, well, then here was your chance. So, you know. I, I don't know what it must be like to be imprisoned in Silesia in a wood for five to six years. I can imagine I'd go stir crazy. I'd imagine I'd want, maybe want to get out. I'd maybe feel that maybe even if it was doing my bit, no matter how minuscule, how tiny, maybe I could feel that would make myself feel better that I was a captive during the war um, who did something rather than a captive during the war who didn't do something. And so it's for that reason why, I, as I say, I sort of put the knife back in its sheath and, Say, so, you know, I get it. Guy, before we round off, can you remind our listeners the name of your book and where can they get it? Well, my book is called The Real Great Escape and it, it is just just Google it and my name, Guy Walters, and you will find it um, on your normal uh, uh, book retail website. 
Um, and yeah, it's it's in all the normal formats as well. Um, also translated into various languages. And um, so yeah, it's uh, it's uh, yeah, it's I, I, I would like to think it's a good read. And you know, and and even though it sounds like I'm really negative about it, you know, Alina, I, I want to assure people that it's it's it is still a, a it's still a, a very very inspiring story. And 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 I think it's more inspiring when you look at all the nuance and complication rather than just going. Yeah, it's all heroic and great and yippee dee doo dah and everyone was brilliant. You know, it's actually, I think war stories, you know, need, need to be very careful. They're not just the kind of war movie version. War stories are very, very, very rarely like they are in the movies. Exactly. So make sure you go out and buy yourselves a copy. Any any of Guy's books are great. I've got them all on my bookshelf. So it's only you've only signed oh, one of mine, I think. Only oh one. right. Well, that's an excuse for coming out to Poland when COVID. Does. Oh, do you know what? You've got to come out to Poland <laughs> now. Just I to do. Start. I want to. And to meet my student. So she's she absolutely loves you. So that would be a highlight for her. Great. Well, I I I I am um, no big fan of yours, Alina. I can't wait to get out there again. Thank you guys so much. This has been so inspiring and you are welcome on our podcast anytime. Hopefully in a year's time. Thank you. Okay. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join... There's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them, and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash hack history, or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support, and here's to your next great 